This is uh, George Gilbert. We're on the ground at the Data Science Summit in the Marriott Marquis in San Francisco. And we're with Jan Neumann, um, who denies he's uh, related to John von Neumann. But uh, based on the work he's done, it sounds like it's a distinct possibility. He works for Comcast and their customer journey uh, with machine learning and applying it to uh, technologies that we all experience is uh, very interesting. Uh, Jan, why don't you tell us um, what was the initial application, um, how it got started, and uh, how it got applied? Yeah, the group I work for, in, which is Comcast Labs Washington, D.C., originally used to be a startup that focused on video search applications. So Comcast bought them. Um, as I said, I wasn't part of it in 2005 to basically power the video web search behind their um, Comcast.com website. And um, so this, the secret sauce there was really to use natural language technology to not just identify like when a word is being spoken within a video, but also like what's the context around that. And so there was a core kind of team which used NLP, which kind of falls under machine learning nowadays. And then after a couple of years, when they saw like how successful basically the search was, Comcast decided to let this group basically develop additional machine learning algorithms um, to support the content discovery within Comcast. So, so before we go to the next application, um, how was it applied to use sort of the context, you know, NLP within context to find content so the idea was that you basically index every single word within that is being spoken within the video, and then at the same time you also look at what are the related words next to it to identify like what is the segment that is um, semantically related to this word that you're searching for. But so if I basically yeah. type in a word, it will not just take me to when the word was spoken, but it starts a little bit earlier at the beginning of the segment where the, at the semantically related segment. Now, would the end user for this be like the news department looking up related clips, or would it be end users who were searching for? So at this point it was end users who were using the Comcast website to look for interesting web videos. So they were typing in search terms that they were interested in, and it would return then a ranked list of clips, kind of subsets of the larger web videos, that um, hopefully would match what they were looking was for. Was it Comcast content or was it like, you know, broader content? It was uh, not necessarily Comcast content, but content distributed via the Comcast website at the time. Okay, okay. So, and just to, to touch on the NLP tools, were these open source tools that you applied to make it, uh, to extract intelligence from the video? Or were the tools themselves also developed based on, say, uh, academic research? So these were developed in-house, so the at that point, this, the secret sauce of the startup was their in-house developed capabilities. Okay. And at that point, you wouldn't probably call it like big data, it was more like the traditional small-scale machine learning, right. handwritten C code, et cetera. But since then, we have grown up, so to speak, and Comcast then decided to kind of give us the responsibility to develop all the content discovery algorithms that now power the new X1 entertainment system. Okay, so tell us more, how did that path, what was that growth path? So you know, the, what, and, and sort of what challenges did you have to go over? Um, skills wise, data, um, scalability, things like that. So the, the challenge that we have is that Initially, we were a relatively small team, so we were only about eight to 10 PhDs at that time. Um, with like a background mostly in NLP, like my personal background is computer vision, so I was asked to kind of join to basically add image analysis, video analysis capabilities right. to the mix. Um, but at the end, uh, the underlying technologies are all machine learning based. So they asked us, could we develop a recommendation algorithm in-house and um, one of our researchers came up with an algorithm that we then compared against external vendors and we found out that our internal algorithm was performing as well or better than what other vendors were offering to us. Which as in the uh, uh, distributor of uh, movies via um, uh, DVDs? Well, we, they, we obviously did not offer the algorithm to us, so we can't really compare one to one, but the companies who spend a lot of time 
um, and said, hey, we can offer you our recommendation solution and who actually work with TV providers in Europe and other places. Um, based on customer testing, our algorithm, internal algorithm, performed as well. So then Comcast made a strategic decision to develop an algorithm in-house and increase the team. We hired like data engineers, people who were familiar with Hadoop and other big data uh, technologies, and then scaled up a solution that is now powering the recommendation systems behind the X1 system. So this, it sounds like it's a Comcast secret sauce, and it's not something that you'll license as a piece of advanced technology. Correct, it's like developed in-house, because the advantages of being able to adapt to the unique kind of constraints, and given that the size of Comcast, it was worthwhile to do it in-house versus licensing other technologies. We're definitely building on top of other technologies like Hadoop, like Spark, um, and um, also here, like the data graph lab, which is also part of what we're um, using. So to um, basically build kind of a best of breeds model, breed model, but it takes into account like a lot of the peculiarities of our data um, to basically give our customers the best um, solution at the end. Okay, can you give us a, a little more sense of how the third party technologies gave you sort of a higher place to, you know, st a starting point? I mean, the advantage nowadays is that machine t learning technologies are so advanced that, um, and as you saw like in the keynote earlier this morning by Carlos, that it becomes easy and easier to try out ideas at scale, right? So if you're a data scientist, you, we are good at like the math, we're good at understanding machine learning models, but we're not necessarily good at kind of writing high performance um, code from the bottom up. And so what the existing technologies allow us to do is to kind of build upon all that distributed work and then add the secret sauce on top of it and really and be able to leverage or apply the models that we built on our laptop to like basically scale it up to Comcast scale. Sort of the way Spark says we want to make it easy to you, for you to take what was done perhaps in a single user notebook and exactly. scale it. So we're definitely so benefiting a lot from this kind of paradigm change. Tell us what are some of the scalable pieces that you're building on that weren't available a couple years ago? So, I mean, the hardest problem we had initially was that it was very difficult to kind of transfer complex machine learning models that we built like on our machines using Python, for example, onto the Hadoop platform. We had to use Java, we had to um, kind of rewrite from scratch to fit the MapReduce paradigm. And now with the advent of Spark and other tools like the like Graph Lab, it becomes just much easier to kind of use where the data scientists who develops the algorithms can use the same tool to also deploy the solution. And you avoid mistakes being made in the translation um, from the model to the actual um, deployment. This and is, let me, also the, let, me, let me just jump in there for a sec. But you're saying that the development platform is also the deployment platform, which is potentially significant. So you operationalize the models maybe on a different cluster, but the same technology. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. So we are, I mean, not all the way there, but that's kind of the process going on. Mm. Okay, wow. So um, what might this look like in the future? Well, I think that convergence will continue. So we're given like the quick growth of the tool and the ease of deployment and um, other like, technologies like Docker, which make it very easy to have like the same technology on your laptop. That, I mean, uh, the kind of like same technology stack on your laptop that you have in the data center um, that we will be able as like data scientists to kind of develop a solution and directly try and try to translate it into a company-wide uh, deployment. Now, um, the, the uh, Hadoop is getting hardened. It's, there's, got, there's some seams in there in terms of operational complexity and you know, development complexity because it's more of an ecosystem than a product. Um, but Spark is making great strides in coming together so that you can integrate the streaming, machine learning, you know, SQL querying, uh, graph processing, and with the Tungsten project, you know, running at 
you know, speed right. on the metal. Right. Is that something that looks like it's going to pull you in that direction? Well, we're definitely very interested in tungsten too, and in the technologies and monitoring it very closely. Um, like we have been um, like presenting like some of the work that I presented today about the real-time recommendations. We also presented at the Spark Summit East this year. So we are definitely um, very active in exploring how Spark and other technologies can help us with our like improving basically our infrastructure, our deployments, the make it make our pace of development quicker, and, um, and overall improve the quality of our products. Okay. And with that, uh, I'm George Gilbert um, on the floor. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back shortly.